a resource-based economy in its working state is really quite simple, uh, deceptively simple, in fact, given the complexity and balance, uh, confusion and uncertainty of the monetary market system that we all endure today. Uh, a method I will point out as I go along that it is completely decoupled uh, from the natural world, from human needs. Uh, it exists as a mere abstraction floating in the air. In part three, objections and projections, which will hopefully be a little bit fun, I will touch upon some of the more common criticisms of this direction, along with what we, those of us that identify with this in a very sincere way, are likely to expect as this direction gains more attention across the world. I think it's really important we come to terms with the inevitable hostility, if you will, that arises when we broach the deep-seated subjects that we do. It's important to remember that we're all victims of culture, as has been pointed out by previous speakers. And while many people are indeed coming to terms with the growing social problems and do see the Zeitgeist Movement, the Venus Project, and the resource-based economy as a viable solution, there are also many that have a very, very powerful identification with the current model and in all seriousness view our work as an extreme threat to their identity and it's something that unfortunately I think will grow. <laughs> You're applauding that? You're funny. Then in part four, I will talk briefly about the transition, something that's also been alluded to very well. I come at it from a similar angle and a little more general. Um, uh, the complexity and lack of predictability it holds, of course, is often elusive to those that immediately hear about this information, of course, ask the immediate question, how do we do it? You know, changing the world is not easy, especially when the concept presented is probably the most radical social shift the species has ever faced or considered, but this is why we're here. Uh, the core interest of the Zeitgeist Movement is, in fact, actually the defining interest is to put our heads together, to work together to figure out how to actually get this done. That's why we're here. Um, if anyone, by the way, is simply waiting for me to tell them what to do or anyone else to guide their way, I'm sorry you're going to be disappointed. The Zeitgeist Movement is not a follow the leader movement. The only way this movement will work is if each one of you in this audience, each one of you listening to this webcast, each one of you viewing this event archive in the future and sees the merit of this is prepared to take the time and sacrifice to become an expert on this material and be able to transmit it to your fellow man in a fluid way. That's how, thank you. I, I've ended two of my previous films with The Revolution Is Now, and I want to clarify that The Revolution is a revolution of thought. It's a revolution of creativity, of thought, it, it ingenuity, a revolution of consciousness. So I want to just understand, make it, excuse me, make it very, very clear that this is an information-based movement. It's an enlightenment of understanding what can be if we cared enough. All right, part one, a self-generating model. A wise man once said, the most profound understandings tend to be the most obvious yet overlooked. I want everyone to keep that in mind as I run down the following section. For as elementary as what I'm about to point out may seem, these issues, issues are far from being given the relevance they actually deserve. You know, that of course mentality. Oh yeah, of course. Those who say that tend to not understand what you're saying. Natural law. A natural law is a property of what we call nature, or in effect the whole of the physical phenomenon around us to which we are symbiotically connected. Classic example is the law of gravity, of course. Doesn't matter how much faith I have to believe I can jump up right now and dance on the ceiling. The law of gravity simply won't allow it. And since the effects of gravity are also measurable and predictable, becoming a tool, this knowledge becomes the basis of inference, which we use to make more accurate decisions law was discovered, all sorts of possibilities began to emerge, and the world became a little bit more intelligent about what was possible and what wasn't when it comes to the phenomenon related to it. It builds up upon, we build upon natural law. As another example, before, excuse me, before the germ basis of disease was discovered by Louis Pasteur, there are many ineffective and outright dangerous treatments for uh, human sickness, as anyone who studies medical history will know. Um, 
In fact, we, of course, would look back at these strange and suspicious, often uh, superstitious, in fact, methods and wonder how could we possibly have been so misinformed? Yet, we seldom recognize this trend as a universal and how it applies to us today. Most rarely consider that many of our current modern practices might be in the same boat. To be looked back upon by future human societies, which will wonder what the hell were they thinking? Didn't they see the natural law referent for that issue, etc.? The point here is that the evolution of scientific discoveries, discoveries which always, always originate from feedback from the natural world, constantly refine our understandings. If, of course, we're open to receive it, which is a conversation in and of itself. It creates dependable, testable reference that we can use to assist in our reasoning about a problem's solution or even invention. The process of transfer or reason from a given law to be extrapolated to an extrapolated conclusion, excuse me, is called inferential logic, as if anyone's ever studied these things in college. Nearly every man-made thing you see around you in the modern world is essentially a product of this reasoning. Everything. However, there is one area of human life, which we all have to admit, which goes virtually untouched by the natural law reference and the extrapolation of this reasoning. And that, of course, is our social system. Somehow, human organization is excluded here. For some reason, the social arrangement that we utilize goes untouched as evolution continues of information. It exists as one of the most dated practices of organization I think we have left, in fact. Now, again, I could break off into many different areas from this point in regard to how provably ineffective and archaic the whole of human social management is conducted, from our prison systems to the banking oligarchs that we blindly accept to the grand distortion that I literally have, could talk for hours and hours on. And if any of you have seen my prior presentations, social pathology, I strongly suggest them. But that's not the point of what, uh, what this presentation is about, because I want to hone in. For the sake of this short presentation, I want to narrow it down to one thing, and that's universal human needs. Many throughout modern history have been trying to find a universal distinction for what we call human nature, a very Sim, a, very, um, a very open word these days, used almost flagrantly by the population. The question becomes, what traits are universal, really, across the whole of the human species? You really can't define human nature without that essentially being the case. Well, rather than speculate, which is, again, what the great majority of the public does in this, in this and then, in fact, I'm going to talk about it a little bit later as an argument that moves against us. People often bring this up. Let's actually think about what we actually know Human nature, in a general sense, is at least a set of immutable human needs that run through the species without exception. Needs which are not only govern our physical health, which is the first thing most people think of when you think of a human need, such as food, but can actually also trigger different predictable behavioral, behavioral and physiological tendencies that are quite elusive in the organism that are not readily apparent in the sense of causality that we typically think of. Furthermore, it isn't just those needs must be met in a traditional input sense. There's also the very real need for all of us to pr have protection against other forms of stimulus that can corrupt us, that can distort us. As will be touched upon in a moment, certain environmental or social stressors, for example, can create profound yet initially unnoticed consequences in human development. And it's a very misunderstood and underappreciated fact. Needless to say, if I don't get proper nutrition, water, air, I will cease to exist over time. If I'm exposed to substances that are toxically, chemically toxic to my biology, such as ingesting mercury or the like, I will likely get very sick or have permanent brain damage. If I suffer a serious vitamin deficiency as a child, there's a predictable detrimental outcome for my personal health, such as stunted growth or immunity deficiencies. Immunity deficiencies. But Human needs, of course, do not stop at that basic level, and this is really the highlight of this. Humans are biopsychosocial organisms, meaning we are affected by our environment symbiotically 
in very subtle and complex ways. And before I continue, is this, whose water is this? Because I need a, it's mine? Beautiful. You know, it's <laughs> For instance, if a mother in the late stages of pregnancy suffers extreme emotional stress, flooding her system with cortisol, a stress hormone, the nervous system of that child could be predictably compromised in a negative way for the rest of his or her life. For the fetus is in a stage of learning about what the world actually is. It's a natural evolutionary adaptability of the, the growing organism, and it's extremely important at the earliest stages, including, including in utero. This goes for infancy and early childhood as well, a critical developmental period where the organism is literally being programmed, adapted to the possible nature of the world they exist in. An impression, by the way, which has been found to carry again for the entire life of that person in certain ways. If that critical period is met with severe negative stress, suffering, pain, abuse, that child's development, as we all know intuitively, could develop into predictable, predictable tendencies of behavior from what science has been able to teach us, propensities, propensities such as addictions and violence in later life. The point here, with respect to human need, is that the physical, mental, and emotional health of a person can no longer be considered an isolated temporal affair. We are social and environmentally connected in an extremely real way, multifaceted. In fact, as an aside, the historical absolute notion of free will, which was touched upon earlier very well, a blanket assumption which is at the core of our legal system can only be a myth when this understanding is observed. And while, of course, genetics has its obvious place, which I will touch upon a little bit later, there is little denying now that the variation that we see in human health, disease, and in fact, human behavior, appears to be significantly, significantly the result of our social and environmental conditioning highlights through human needs being met or not being met. In other words, while it's obvious that there's cultural conditioning happening, when it comes to our bare needs and the, the spectrum of those, it's accentuated when those distortions, those, when those impressions are met or not met, when we do not get what we need or we are imposed upon by something that we should not be imposed upon. And the life cycle itself, the pre-programming, pre-learning we have as an organism has throughout the cycle different responses to those needs. And naturally, the younger you are, the more the effect will pertain and continue for the rest of your life, the more severe the effect. The problem, of course, is that there is an overall lack of acknowledgement of the biopsychosocial context of human need and its profound effect on us. It goes essentially unnoticed overall by our educational system, the prison system, not to mention its contrast to a competitive economic world driven by a mentality of independence and self-interest. I would even go so far to say that the core idea of being responsible and caring towards each other, or even the environment, in fact, on many levels, is actually held in hostility and contempt by many that have been conditioned by the current model. Little in the world we have created today seems to reflect these very real fundamental needs. They are denied by the social institution. The bottom line here is that if we as a society actually care about the well-being of each other, and hence the symbiotic natural law aspects that create and reinforce that progressive state, we are faced with an immutable social imperative. Across the entire spectrum of what we consider public health today, we now see long-term increases overall in cancer, personality disorders, poverty, obviously, familial deprivation, crime, depression, suicides, addiction, violence, self-harm, kids mutilating themselves, obesity, and many other medical, psychological, and anti-social signposts of an out-of-balance society. Something clearly is very, very wrong. So returning to my basic point, the core referent 
of any social system is the human being and its evolutionarily defined immutable pre-learned need requirements to develop properly, survive, and maintain good health and prosper. To meet those needs, it becomes a given to have proper management of the Earth's resources and intelligent societal organization to make sure that the biopsychosocial elements, the interconnectivity, is also designed to support us in the, all the complexity that pertains to it. Anything less, frankly, is really negligence. In the words of Jacques Fresco, you can't just build a society without having access to the necessities of life. So when I use the term comprehensive systems approach, I'm talking about doing an inventory of the area first and determining what that area can supply. Not just an architectural approach, not just a design approach, but a, the design must be based upon all the requirements to enhance human life. And that's what I mean by an integrated way of thinking, food, clothing, shelter, warmth, love, all those things are necessary. If you deprive people of any of them, you have a lesser human being, less capable of functioning. So in the end, public health, in the broad view, is the ultimate measure of the performance of any social system, along with the intelligent management of the earth, which provides the core resources we need, coupled with social conditions, for example, reduced negative stress, that's paramount to a healthy society. The monetary market system, on the other hand, the governing socioeconomic paradigm of our time, which is based entirely around the near arbitrary movement of money, not the advancement of public health or environmental sustainability as it conflates needs with wants and consumption with progress, shows its true hand when we realize that both human health and the environment which we inhabit are in fact provably in decline. You can take all the monetary economic theories as brilliant and sophisticated as they may sound on paper and their grand loaded rhetoric of supposed freedom and democracy and simply compare those ideals to what is actually happening today. There's no contest. In fact, if there was one word to me which summarizes the current socioeconomic paradigm, it would be inefficient. The monetary market system simply has no direct physical reference for any decision, since the entire model is based on the irrational, scientifically empty whims of monetary exchange and often fictional demand. No overarching, no overarching consideration for the interconnectivity inherent in the world you see around you. No structural interest to efficiently meet the spectrum of human needs and make sure the integrity of each human is sound, regardless of the adverse consequences, both personally, personally and socially, when that is denied. No consideration for the resources which allow for our survival and hence fulfill our needs. In fact, no consideration for the natural orders of balance at all. It is virtually baseless in the light of governing natural law and its demands and restrictions which are immutable. And the world you see around you is proof of that. A resource-based economy, on the other hand, is very, very different. And this brings us to part two, economic components defined. A resource-based economy is a direct response to natural law, inferentially derived to figure out how to best meet the spectrum of human needs in the most efficient and sustainable way possible taking into account what actually supports us, which is the symbiotic relationship of the Earth and this delicate, providing biosphere we all share. From there, we are able to arrange society with very little need for human opinion, if our collective goal, of course, is to maximize our sustainability, human health, and economic efficiency. This system is self-evident The goal of a resource-based economy, of course, is to achieve peak ecological sustainability and operational efficiency while meeting the spectrum of essential needs of literally every human being on Earth without exception, adapting itself to new scientific understandings in human and environmental discoveries as they arise and applying it immediately without any interference whatsoever once the validity 
scientific validity of those interests are proven. Now you notice in the prior statement about needs and wants, well, I, excuse me, you'll notice I said the wants of every human being on earth, but I, I excuse me, let me start again. <laughs> now you'll notice I didn't say wants of every human on earth. It's important we understand the distinction between needs and wants. Wants are not based on natural law. Wants are social contrivances based on cultural influences. Fueled today by what we could call the infinite growth paradigm, which demands that everyone keep consuming at increasing rates, by the way, in order for the growth economy to remain afloat. The result, in part, is that wants and needs are now conflated. It's a strategy. Some people have excessive purchasing power and can have virtually anything they want, while at the same time the great majority now can now can not only achieve their temporal, cultural, generated wants, they can't even meet their basic human needs. And if you have a system that conflates those two, suddenly no, no one's responsible because it comes to a single entity. So we can accept the fact that a child dies every four seconds for no reason because of poverty. On a different level, you know, I often get the question when we bring up this model, what if I want a 50-room mansion in a resource-based economy? Where's my freedom to have that? And I usually ask back, okay, well, what if I want a million room mansion? Or perhaps, what if I want the entire continent of Africa as my backyard? <laughs> At what point does this so selfish, acquisitive, spoiled interest become blatantly irresponsible and socially offensive? Given we want, of course, again, live on a finite planet, and two, in a society which one way or another, regardless of the social system, resources must be shared. Excessive, ostentatious living, to me, is really an antisocial form of neuroses, groomed by a social system that needs, again, constant demand and rewards arbitrary status for the sake of that demand. It's a psychological scam, in a way. And if you will, frankly, uh, if you think about it deeply, it's actually a form of violence against humanity itself. Now, before I run down, thank you. Before I run down the dominant economic considerations underlying the mechanics of a resource-based economy, I want to conclude the subject on needs and wants by pointing out the brilliance of Jacques Fresco's work with the Venus Project and his focus on advanced understandings and methods. The modern reality is that as long as we as a society understand the limits of the finite world we inhabit and respect each other as equals in the basic fundamental sense that we all have the right to live, we can not only meet the basic needs of every human on earth as I described, but given the incredible state of advanced technology today, its rate of change, we can easily enter into the realm of meeting the wants of the human population to agree likely unimaginable for 99% of the world today. We can create a vast material abundance if we simply updated and organized ourselves efficiently using modern understandings. Now, coming back to the model, I want to specifically isolate three aspects. Aspects, again, which are critical to responsible decision making for the sustainable fulfillment of human necessity resource accounting, dynamic equilibrium, and strategic design. Resource accounting. We live, again, in a virtually closed planetary biosphere with a set of mostly finite resources at our disposal. Given this reality, the logic becomes quite clear as to our responsibility if we wish to allow our habitat to sustain itself for future generations. We must organize an account, it's a no-brainer. Proper economic resource allocation really cannot, be, really cannot be made unless we have a clear understanding of what we have and where it is. Again, it's no mystery, yet bizarrely it's not done at all today in any kind of concentrated way. 
But accounting is only the first step of this responsible earth and social management I'm describing. We also need to track the rates of change, of course, and regeneration, if applicable. Again, it seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? It seems so obvious. Well, why aren't we doing it? Here we have what could be called dynamic equilibrium. A classic example of this issue today is deforestation. Uh, trees have a natural growth rate. We can't really alter that, at least not now. And you know, if our use of wood exceeds the natural regeneration rate of a particular area, uh, we have a problem. It's the definition of unsustainability. Remember, as an aside, the monetary market model, again, requires as much consumption as possible to keep the growing population employed and the economy operational. This is, very simply, by all definition, complete ecocide. Remember, a core requirement of a true, a true economy, a real economy, based on something tangible, is to economize, to be strategically efficient and conservative. Today, we, of course, live in an anti-economy, to quote John McMurtry. And this leads us to strategic design. Efficiently meeting the spectrum of human needs on a finite planet in a sustainable way means resource allocation must be optimized strategically and conservatively. Today, this is haphazardly done through arbitrary monetary rationalizations. It is about what can be afforded by the producer or the consumer not what the most efficient strategic use actually is. Not to mention the issue of longevity of a given good and the method to be used for its eventual breakdown, the recycling. None of that is considered in the initial design of anything, for as I mentioned prior, it's all about constant turnover. Remember, an economy is about increasing efficiency at all times. It's about doing what is most scientifically correct not what some company can afford in order to remain competitive in the market system. We need strategic allocation and design as derived from proven technical parameters that assure maximum efficiency and sustainability. Anything less, again, is just absolute negligence when you really sit down and think about it. It's, it's uh, beyond depressing and enraging when you see what's actually occurring. So, resource accounting, dynamic equilibrium, strategic design. This sets the basic underlay of the resource-based economy model. These core components are the basic orienters, if you will, which take into account the natural law I just described from the standpoint of earth and human systems, which are the two component attributes in the broadest scheme that are, that are that essentially in consideration here. There's more, obviously, there's the environment and everything else, but we are here to sustain ourselves. And naturally, of course, symbiotically related, we have to sustain the planet and the entire ecosystem simultaneously, including the bees that pollinate, uh, health of the oceans, and everything else. So uh, sometimes I've had an argument come against me, say, well, this is too human-centric, which I thought was extremely interesting, you know, because people have so much sympathy for animals and everything else, as which they should, but we have to understand that it's all worked in. It's all one big system. The extinction spasms we see are detrimental to us, depending, obviously, on what they are. Uh, but everything that's happening is both natural, but it's also interfered by what we're doing. And the fact that we still have certain areas of the planet that have to do manual pollination because of the death of bees in certain regions is a, is a truly horrifying uh, and a revealing notion regarding the state of affairs today. So. Let's continue the inference now. Building upon these three points, we can then arrive at the following specific points. And I am going to be making a little bit of a jump here because of the time restrictions of this presentation. We need to move from a growth to a steady state economy. Dynamic equilibrium cannot be maintained in a growth economy, for constant growth is impossible on a finite planet. Two, we need a collaborative system, not a competitive one. Strategic design, as I just discussed, cannot be fulfilled when cost efficiency is in play. The competitive system is wholly irresponsible and inefficient. I'm not even talking about a moral issue here. Uh, it, it's intrinsically antisocial and corrupt, I will admit that, but it actually doesn't even work. Three, we need a planned system. A system designed to take into account resource allocation, dynamic equilibrium, and strategic design explicitly in a unified way, synergistically constructed. 
The dispersed, haphazard, free-for-all corporate system doesn't even come close. And the lack of efficiency is simply unacceptable. We've been living as though we are on a, on a finite planet. People behave as though they've been groomed into this idea that we have infinite resources. And the, as a natural consequence with what's occurring today, with water, food, oil, energy issues, uh, this rude awakening is finally taking the world by storm, where it most certainly will uh, very soon as time moves forward if nothing's done. Four, automation is put before human labor on all possible levels. This falls under the component of strategic design. Not only do we need to design consumer goods <clears throat> to be as efficient as possible, the very design of the production methods utilized for those goods needs to be equally as strategically efficient to maximize accuracy, conservation, and output. Productivity, as I've described before, is in fact now inverse to employment in most sectors studied, uh, which means it is in fact socially irresponsible not to automate as much as we possibly can, for it allows greater abundance and efficiency. Here is a chart of the G7 advanced industrialized countries showing how employment and manufacturing has been dropping while manufacturing output has risen substantially. Mechanization is simply far too productive to be ignored. It is, again, irresponsible not to employ mechanization in every possible economic sector at this point. And five, as was pointed out earlier in the presentation, I'll reiterate this, we move from property to access and the removal of the monetary exchange. I'm a filmmaker and I have two closets jam-packed full of film equipment and grip, grip equipment that I'll maybe use maybe fully once a year at best. So I have to hoard all of this stuff. I would prefer not to have it at all and rent it. But in this system, I lose money in the long run. It's detrimental, it's inefficient economically due to the repeated costs and no resale possibility or investment. So in order to be economically responsible, which we all are forced to be, I have to store it in my apartment. I would prefer not to have to do that at all. In a resource-based economy, there's no such thing as investment, relative value, or the like. So I could simply acquire my cameras from the access facility Use them, return them like a library. It'd be beautiful. And if you extend this idea to the whole of the goods sector, the realization is that we can actually reduce production and the use of resources because they are being spread around while counterintuitively, simultaneously enabling more access to the population when they need it. I hope everyone gets that. Strategic access, it, is, is incredible because it's enabling more people to have more access with less resources consumed. Now, I know it's very difficult to think about, you know, in our, how a property, property, excuse me, our property list society uh, would work from a protectionist standpoint, given the world we live in today. You know, no one's going to steal your car if, if they know they can't resell it or if they can gain access, access to it themselves. People often forget why so-called criminal behavior occurs. There's reasons, and those reasons can be resolved. The system itself that we want to create here is simply designed to meet those needs. That's what an economy is. That's what it does. Money is no longer needed in a world that has an access abundance. And, of course, a population that actually understands what it means to live on a society where humans have to share the resources and it's a finite planet, to reiterate that point. Is it perfect? No, it's not a utopia, and there are a series of holes that even I can punch into it, but that doesn't mean they're not resolvable. It would be cataclysmically better than anything we have now, which is damaging ourselves and our environment, and is on pace to getting worse exponentially. And this brings us to part three, objections and projections. Now, I'm moving very quickly here. The preceding uh, resource-based economic model treatment is a very compressed primer. Uh, Joe did a wonderful job of made a more extensive uh, treatment of this, which is similar to other lectures that have been given and, of course, our orientation guide. So I want everyone to, to I'm really happy that that e thorough explanation was given because this, if you weren't familiar with this, this would be very, very truncated, which it very much is. And I really encourage everyone to follow up if you have questions with all the resources that we have at the zeitgeistmovement.com. Uh, one thing I do recommend as a, as a counterpart to the human necessity angle, the build-up inferential logical approach that I just denoted, is a section called Project Earth I did in a lecture called uh, Where Are We Going? 
while there's also, of course, a truncated version of that in the film Zeitgeist moving forward. So please know that uh, there's much more to it than this, but I hope the reasoning of what I've just described is coming through. My goal here in, this, in that description was to approach it from the angle of human need, which is something, unfortunately, we don't think about. Not just the human need aspect, but also the systems earth approach and the relationship between the two and what we have to do to find balance, maximum efficiency and balance to enable as much prosperity as possible. That's the equation. That's the calculation. Now, my goal with uh, part three is to not only address some very common criticisms uh, and speculations that uh, come up regarding what we just described and all the other materials that we have, but also to use those points to further communicate some other important issues of a resource-based economy. But before I begin, I think it's important to discuss something that's very important to me that I see rising uh, in the community, uh, on, the, on the internet, uh, in my own personal experiences and, and interactions with people, and that is the issue of violence in communication. Needless to say, we're all victims of culture on one level or another. That means we've been influenced and groomed in certain patterns of thought by our environment. And one of the cultural staples of modern society, unfortunately, is the use of verbal violence to support one's position. And sadly, I don't know anyone who doesn't impulsively engage in this from time to time, including myself. Calling people names you know, might not seem as offensive as physical assault, but the intent is essentially the same. The intent is to injure, to dehumanize and humiliate. Verbal violence is just a different degree of physical violence. In fact, I, I'm a firm believer and do, have done tremendous amount of study on the work of Martin Luther King and Gandhi and all of, all of the initiators of the nonviolent communication movement. The goal of nonviolent communication is to try and leave the door open for others to enter if they choose to do so, to unconditionally invite them to accept you regardless, regardless of how much they actually hate you and wish to injure you on whatever level. Easier said than done, but it really is the only effective method. I state this because the nature of our work in the Zeitgeist Movement has become a magnet and will continue to become a magnet for various levels of assault. Think about it. Uh, all of us that are identified with this, we're here telling the world that what they're doing is wrong at the basic level of operation understanding. We're here initiating a global change that exceeds anything attempted in human history, as far as I know a radical shift away from everything the majority of people on this planet have come to identify with. So hostility is not only expected, it's inevitable. And it's very important that we all be prepared for this intellectually and emotionally and have great patience and understanding and know how to behave accurately, if you will. Thank you. Now, we always have a lot of seriousness in, uh, in the discussions that, naturally, seriousness is important. It's, a, it's where we are. But I've tried to make this a little bit more relaxed in my, my, my presentation of, um, of the critics of a resource-based economy. First of all, about 99% of the time, the critics of this system approach it from the standpoint of prior surface associations from history. In fact, the greatest phrase I've ever heard as of yet was someone who referred to it as Marxism with robots. <laughs> now, I'm not blind. That's Tiny the Communist Robot. He's a good guy. Now, I'm not blind. I see the obvious surface associations with historically proposed communism. But the fact is, as I've alluded to in a truncated fashion, the train of thought that arrives at a resource-based economy is self-evident. Those that use this rhetoric often present it as though we are building upon those early ideas. Well, no. Communism in whatever form might not have ever existed and it wouldn't change anything as to the inferential logic that arrives at a resource-based economy. Natural law is natural law. Human needs are human needs and a finite planet is a finite planet. 
So the entire argument is worthless and does nothing but waste time, and I recommend the avoidance of that debate unless you want to bring up what I've just described. If you pay close attention, by the way, the same people that tend to impose their communist, socialist, Marxist label upon us are also the ones that rarely ever address the core foundational reasoning of the model that we're talking about. They never talk about it. They also never talk about the failing social structure. They ignore all of it and just look at the surface appearance, the cover of the book that they recognize, the projection that they've manifest because of their conditioning. Next, we have a unique one, but has become much more prominent, and I hear it more than I care to admit, and that is the feared re-education. <laughs> Since we speak about the need for people to shift their values into something that is more in line with natural law and show the reasoning for it, of course, suddenly we're just like the early totalitarian communists who seek to put people in forced re-education camps so they can be brainwashed into following the social system. Well, actually, any time any known idea is overturned by new information, such as when Galileo informed the Catholic Church that the Earth was in fact not the center of the universe or solar system, re-education had commenced. In fact, the entire whole of the evolution of knowledge is the constant process of, yes, re-education, updating current beliefs. I mean, this is self-evident, but I like to make this very, 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 very clear because I'm, well, frankly tired of hearing it. Again, this is an associative attack ultimately in the end, just like the communist one. It's people that are really trying to pull an emotional reaction out of others to stop their critical thought to really investigate what we're talking about. So communism, oh, they support re-education. Uh, I, I, this is a growing phenomenon, uh, both in, in this sort of a subculture and into pseudo-mainstream attacks that I've seen on myself, the Freeness Project, and the movement. Then we have the Moody outburst. What if I don't want to live in your society? Well, then don't. <laughs> Just as arrangements exist for subcultures today who reject modern life, in the future, equally as viable conditions can be met. If a group wants to break off and go play their little monopoly game somewhere, go ahead. I, you know, I have a hard time believing, frankly, that once the system is set in motion and the fruits of its efficiency are seen by everyone, not to mention the true freedom people will have, which would be unlike anything the world has ever seen once the life-wasting, redundant labor for income system is removed. And then we have our cherished democracy. What about democracy in a resource-based economy? Well, I say, what exactly are you expecting? Wading into some voting booth every couple of years like a mind slave, pushing a button for a candidate you have zero control over once elected? It really, when you step back, it's, I, you can hear the irritation in my voice because in my all, sheer honest opinion, I'm, I can't believe that it's still around. I can't believe we're still doing this. I just, like, it, the, real, the real election of relevance is not the election of people. That is a dated, bizarre uh, notion that we think, we, we, it's a given, it's a give in to really a power system. We're enabling a power system of control, giving, we're literally, as this cartoon depicts, the freedom to elect our dictators because we have no control over anything they do once they're elected and then a couple of years go by, oh, maybe we can remove them. Real election of relevance is not the election of people, it's the election of ideas. It's creating an actual system of interaction where new ideas can be submitted by everyone and they are technically evaluated for their relevance and possibility. Please see the orientation guide that we have at the zeitgeistmovement.com for the proposed central database program, a, a, an extrapolation of modern AI understandings. Sounds fanciful, it sounds like science fiction, but these realities are coming to fruition very, very quickly. And decision-making processes, the digestion of information, even through our crude language, is becoming viable uh, through automated systems. And it would mediate our human interaction and evaluate proposals objectively, as opposed to a political party with lobbyist influences that might see your idea as viable in a, in a scientific sense, but because of their influence, they will override it, which happens on a daily basis. Uh, I probably shouldn't have to even explain that. Okay, and then we have collectivism doesn't work. And this is a very common one. Collectivism just doesn't work. 
If the core basis of collectivism and its foundational definition, which, what is it really? It's simply a group of people working together for their common good as a whole. If this wasn't working, we wouldn't have business, we wouldn't have a military, we wouldn't have sports teams, we wouldn't have people working in any group effort whatsoever. As far as using the model of a collective as the basis of a social system, which is of course a very large extreme of such an idea, and by the way, which has never really been seriously tried. People throw out the collectivist notion as though historically, you know, in the early communist states that these were true collectivist societies. No, they were not. They were always dictatorships by design, autocratic, uh, which is not collective. A real collective is simply society working together as a team, like a family, in fact. Imagine that. And the last one for this section, my favorite, it's against human nature. We are simply unable to work together on a large scale because of our evolutionarily embedded self-interest. No hope, we're stuck, everyone go home. <laughs> to this day, I'm amazed at how many people I run into with no education on the matter whatsoever, not opening one book that throw out the human nature argument as the immutable force that will never allow any type of community, anything really, uh, to come to fruition especially, of course, a resource-based economy. Uh, just recently, I read an article uh, as, that was produced essentially by the John Birch Society, which is a right-wing anti-communist group. At the very last paragraph of this bashing of Zeitgeist and the Venus Project, they're like, well, Jacques Fresco, he can keep his little fantasy, it's nice and cute, but unfortunately, human nature won't allow it. And I can assure you that the guy has never done anything to research what that actually means. It's the last bastion of those who have nothing else to say in defense to support their indoctrination. The ultimate question to delve into this a little bit is, it, is it against human nature to cooperate? That's the central question. It certainly seems like that if you take the narrow view of history on a surface level and you look at the d tremendous divisions and conflicts throughout time. Uh, we see endless series of wars, genocides, conquests, severe competitive tendencies, of course power abuses. And given that's the pattern we recognize historically, given that we see this in our history books with no real background as to the, to the foundation of why that occurred, it's easy to assume that it must just be human nature. That's just the way we are. Forget the environment, that's, that's our programming. Now, to, that's essentially the, the core argument. Is if it's historically reoccurring, it must be human nature. However, we do see, and this is what's ignored, that human beings do cooperate extremely well in certain environments. As much as I don't like the military, it's a collective. It is a unified system working together. It is a collaborative system. They train and work together, and they do so very well. Granted, granted. They are competing against a common enemy, so there's your division, but cooperation is existing nevertheless even if it's isolated. I had a conversation with a behavioral biologist at Stanford University, and he made a very unique point to me regarding the subject of self-interest and the us against them pattern that exists as he's seen it through almost all primate species, including ourselves, of course. It appears that if the human species is very, very different in its us against them issue, while it's concurrent, while it exists, obviously the pattern exists, the malleability of who the them is and who the us is is almost as arbitrary as anything else. On a dime, we can turn the other cheek and find a new enemy. So who is to say that that enemy has to be another person or group? The conditions might simply be dictating that due to the scarcity of the environment, perhaps, which is, of course, probably the reality. What if the human species came together to move against other enemies, perhaps true threats to the survival of the species as a whole, which, of course, as we've seen in Japan, are natural disasters and diseases? Why can't that be the them of the human species and we be the us?
at the end of the day, the entire thing is really about the environment, and that is what navigates this. So I have no, I have no uh, problems. I, I have no, I find no dichotomy uh, in the understanding of human nature with respect to us being able to collaborate, because the patterns are all there. It's simply creating the condition and the understanding to make it happen. Okay, so there's a great deal I could have said on the nature versus nurture and evolutionary psychology issue. Uh, the, the film that I released, the first opening section, I think does a very good job to create a primer of some very important aspects. So I'm going to leave it at that and move into part four, transition and the movement. The transition itself from our current system into a resource-based economy is, of course, a complex thing to consider with variables beyond our current foresight, as been alluded to by previous presenters. Uh, the central issue is awareness, of course. If the public's consciousness can be expanded to understand and accept the incredible potential the future can hold, where poverty, war, 95% of all crime, mundane, repetitive, meaningless jobs would be eliminated then I feel, obviously, they would be more likely to adjust their values and expectations and associations accordingly. This data is coming on the heels now of a global economic, ecological, and dare I say spiritual or confidence collapse across the world. And the underlying mechanism of these problems, driven by the monetary market system's very mechanics and values, are generated to support it, that are generated to support it, excuse me, show no signs of stopping. And I think we're going to see, as I mentioned earlier, an acceleration of these issues as time moves forward. I'm not going to expand um, on the different levels of social failure as I see it, because it isn't the scope of this program. Uh, in a lecture I called, called Social Pathology, which was done in Z-Day in 2009, I do a huge expansion of this. So I, if you want to understand the pending collapse, which deals with technological unemployment, peak oil resource depletion, water and food shortages that are pending because of failures of efficiency, systemic global sovereign debt default and hyperinflation, along with massive, well, the result, in fact, of massive civil unrest. As confidence continues to fail, people become more alienated, poverty increases, and income disparity increases as the wealthy work to protect themselves and grab as much as they can, because that is, that is their reaction to these types of things. The worse it becomes, the worse it's going to get. I hate to say it that way, but that, that is the natural unfolding as has been happening. So we're faced with a massive uncertainty, and there is no transition plan, you know, that I could explain to you that would hold up over time. What we do know is that we need to get programs going which will continue to get this information out there and spread the word and, and basically fuel the movement. One program I hope to get going, in fact, is a global redesign team. I've been briefly in conversation with the Venus Project about this, and it's also affiliated with a prior online concept called From Earth to Venus, which is going to be, a, well, as I'll explain, essentially, we want to objectively consider how each area of the planet would be properly redesigned for maximum sustainability. So if there's engineers in the movement, if there's city planners, it's time to come together in a virtual sense, understanding whatever we can to start to reconstruct this and show the world what can be done, and then have an annual presentation, very much like Z-Day, but of a more focused element, more focused uh, context, where the work would be presented to the world to say, hey, we just designed the entire uh, North American uh, system. Look how efficient that is. And hopefully, hopefully, leaders, governments, uh, people in business will come to terms with the need for this type of understanding, and it will, it will take hold. And it, it, in a transitional sense, that might be a good picking, uh, starting point, excuse me, where they come to these conferences and they learn big presentations about how to literally redesign the society to benefit us in the most sustainable way possible. You know, we have, a, uh, we have this thing called the G20, you know? Well, we need the Z20, or the Z200, in fact. <laughs> to begin to show those people and the world what a real economy actually is. <laughs> now, our current goal, of course, in this phase is critical mass, um, unifying the world to understand what actually constitutes our survival and prosperity, as we've discussed. 
and how the current model is really injuring everyone, regardless of their wealth. The stress relationships uh, are, are unescapable, and they're not necessary, even for the uberly rich. As of now, we have over a thousand chapters in 70 countries over the span of essentially two years. We have proven as a movement, uh, in almost an unprecedented sense, with very little financial uh, support, that we are able to organize and mobilize across borders, languages, even religions. And this third annual uh, Zeitgeist Day event, with hundreds of events across the world, show the power of influence, the possibility, the power of our cooperation. So third Zeitgeist Day, hundreds of events across the world, we show amazing power of collaboration, amazing group effort, something that really is unprecedented. We have the ability to harness uh, a global movement something that I think many people have strived for but have never been able to do, and we've done it in a very short period of time. And we are, in fact, in a transitional phase now, unifying the world into an understanding that our very survival is contingent upon bridging the differences between cultures. There's nowhere to hide anymore. There's no place for the type of division that exists. It's literally unsustainable. Finding the empirical common ground that we all share through our fundamental needs is really that bridge. And if we can come to terms with that, obviously, and get the world to come together, we might actually have something we can call a civilization, to be perfectly frank. And in conclusion, I'm gonna end with one of my favorite quotes of all time. The old appeals to racial, sexual, and religious chauvinism, to rabid nationalist fervor, are beginning not to work. A new consciousness is being developed which sees the earth as a single organism and recognizes that an organism at war with itself is doomed. We're one planet, thank you.